which both of which flow south. We were scouting out some good fishing spots when Buck grabbed my arm. Look at that. I looked. Sugar, honey, iced tea. What is it, Buck? Bullfrog. Bullfrog. Bulloni. It was more like a bull dog. It was big. And then Buck said, yeah, yeah, look over there. Swimming in the river was a snake. I said, Buck, that snake's got to be six, seven feet long. His head was bigger than my fist. And he said, yeah, and look where it's headed. It was going straight to the frog. Now, the frog was sitting on a rock in the middle of the river, minding his own business, soaking up the sun, and he was having a good day. I could I could tell he was having a good day because I could hear above the rippling sound of the water, he was singing. Frog went a courtin' and he did ride, uh huh. Frog went a courtin' and he did ride, uh huh. Frog went a courtin' and he did ride. Sword and pistol by his side. Bam! That's when the snake came up and struck him right from behind. Well, that snake went straight up in the air with the frog. Now, I told you that frog was big. <laughs> His jumping legs were as stout, as sturdy, as a, as a Swedish speed skater. They were above the clouds. And when they came down with a crash, a splash, a wave of water cascaded over me and Buck. We were soaking wet. And now we sat down to, to watch this drama unfold and we knew it was going to be a 22 inning baseball game <laughs> the frog and the snake had settled down on a rock on that rock and the snake every once in a while would open his mouth and take a little bit of the frog and the frog every once in a while would open his mouth and take a little bit of the snake well i pulled out my day pack grabbed my peanut butter and jelly sandwich my buddy Buck reached into his duffel bag that he dragged along and he pulled out one of them rotisserie chickens, you know, the kind you get at Wegmans, picked it up and started tearing it apart. And then I heard crunch, Buck, Buck, don't, don't eat the bones. He looked at me and smiled. <laughs> Good calcium, man. Then he reached in and pulled out a sack from McDonald's. Buck, what do you, just a dozen of them little sliders. And then he reached in and pulled out one of them rectangular purple boxes. I said, B Buck, Duncan, Duncan Donuts, you, you got cream filled? And he looked at me and said, oh, yeah, but man, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't bring enough to share. And then with a mournful sigh, oh, man, if I had brought some lemons, could have made some, could have made some wall kill river lemonade. Oh, well, this will have to do. And he reached into his bag and he, he pulled out a 30 pack of Genesee, mm -hmm. 30 pack of Jenny, as the locals call it here. You can get yourself a 30 pack of Jenny. All you got to do is swim across the Delaware River right from Pennsylvania. Go right to the town of Port Jervis, New York. $13.99 at Easy Way Beverage. Oh, anyway, <laughs> after our little lunch, we, we lay back on the grass and I fell asleep. When I awoke, the back of my neck was blazing red from the poison ivy. The front of my neck was blazing red from the sun that had traveled across the sky. Well, I looked for the frog and the snake. <gasps> Buck, Buck, wake up, wake up. The frog and the snake were still on that rock in the middle of the river, but the frog had almost completely eaten the snake and the snake had almost completely eaten the frog. We raced to the water's edge and watched. Now the, the sun had set and we were squinting when, when suddenly Buck started jumping up and down, hooting, hollering, slapping me on the back. I said, Buck, Buck, well, what happened? Where are they? And he said, you didn't see? I said, see what? I, I blinked. You blinked? Oh, man. 
And then he explained. The frog and the snake, they both opened their mouths at the same time. They swallowed each other up. And it was true. They weren't there. The snake had completely eaten the frog. The frog had completely eaten the snake. I looked at Buck and said, Buck, you was right. You won the bet. Here's your $20. Frog ate the snake. He turned to me and said, Ken, you was right. Snake ate the frog. Here's your $20. So that's the story about the time that me and Buck made a bet against each other and we both won. Now, if you don't believe me, you come up and I'll take you along the banks of the Wallkill River and then I'll take you to the Sussex Airport pub where, where my buddy Buck hangs out and you could ask him. He'll tell you the same story that I just told you. All right, Ken. Yay. I don't know if I'm unmuted. Um, gotcha. am I? Oh, okay, good. Yay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing that because you know, we can't clap because the latency that's, um, um, difficult. Now it's time for my Alex Trevec interview of you, Ken. What, well, uh, you taught for 42 years. Mm -hmm. Started in 1973. Man. What did you teach? Well, the truth, man. Well, okay. So I started as a third grade teacher in 1973 when there were no men in the primary grades, but the, the woman who was interviewing me, um, elderly woman sitting with a lit cigarette between her fingers, <laughs> she offered me a third grade job. And I, I said, you want me to teach little kids? And she looked at me and she said, yes, I need a man in third grade. And I sat there, uh oh, maybe I shouldn't take this job. What kind of third graders they got in this place? But so I took the job and it might be cliche-ish to say this. I don't know if there's a word as such a word as cliche-ish. If there is, oh, it is now. Somebody there should, there should be. Yeah. But those, those kids taught me more than I taught them. They, they were wonderful. And that's, that's when I actually started telling some stories. Cool. Um, so I love the wood paneling you have there. It's a scenic place yeah. where you're, where you're well, doing, where you stage your shows. Where, I'm where in, are you, sir? I'm in my outhouse. Ah. You, you do yeah, like the outdoors, yeah. don't it, you? you know, it, well, I, I do, but it's it's the best place I uh, best place where I can get reception here. Ah, I see. Okay. Well, let's let, thanks again, Ken. That was wonderful. Sure. Okay. And now I'm going to um, read, and I know our judges are are um, making some notes. I'm going to read once again um, how the audience votes. Audience, pay attention. Hey, audience, pay attention. Vote after all the performers are done. That's the most important rule. Please don't vote before the um, performers are done. If you do, your vote won't count. So, then, yeah, yeah. All right. So please vote after the performers are done. Finished is another word for that. Um, you're voting for the liar or lie you like best. Look for the link in the chat. And by the way, if you chat with me while we're doing this, I can't respond because I'm not that smart. But um, look for the link in the chat or go to Susquehanna folk.org slash vote and if you're not from uh, that area susquehanna is s-u-s-q-u-e-h-a-n-n-a because you might need that um you're welcome to open the voting page in the browser window um just don't submit don't click submit um and what else uh early votes won't be counted i already said that voting will be open for seven minutes after I say one, two, three, go at the end of everything, that's when we will know we're using the honor system. Uh, one vote per viewer, please. All right. Just vote once. This is not one of those contests where your friend has submitted something and you go online every day and you go from your Instagram page and your Facebook page and your Twitter page, you know, no one vote per person. Um, let's see. Audience vote, audience vote, along with judges scores, determine the winner. Do you understand everybody not? Okay. Are the judges ready for me to introduce the next storyteller? I'm looking at you, Jess. So if that's the case, nod. You don't know? Is that a yes? All right, judges, I hope you're writing fast. Um, here we go. 
Jason Sable tells stories to fill the void in his soul created by his day job as an attorney. He lives in York with his son and two cats. All three are cute, and one of them scratches the furniture more than the other two. He likes to cook, enjoys a great cocktail, and has an encyclopedic knowledge of 90s rap music. Wu-Tang is for the kids. Please, please welcome Jason Sable. Hi, Jason. Hey, how are you? Good, man. Good. So my great-grandfather was a walking, talking, tall tale. Uh, he grew up in a small coal mining town south of Pittsburgh. And one winter, his parents saved up enough money to get him a beautiful pair of buckskin gloves. Now, Charles loved these buckskin gloves. He wore them every day in the winter. But come summertime, he wanted to play baseball. And his parents couldn't afford a baseball mitt. So what did Charles do? He fashioned one out of the left buckskin glove into a catching style mitt. And that is how Charles Roth got his lifelong nickname of Bucky. Turns out Bucky was a pretty darn good baseball player. And eventually he was able to upgrade his buckskin glove to an actual catcher's mitt. Although he always kept a piece of that buckskin glove with him, said he had to keep it for luck. Well, uh, Bucky was pretty lucky, I guess, because uh, he was scouted and signed by his beloved Pittsburgh Pirates to a minor league baseball contract. Now, baseball players didn't get paid like they get paid now, uh, but this was still a big deal because it meant from April to September, Bucky got to play baseball for a job. And then in October, he returned to Greene County in the coal mines and would work in the coal mines from October to March. Now, during those glorious summers, uh, Bucky's best friend was a southpaw pitcher named Delmont, Delmont Blue. Now, Delmont was a bit of a mischievous fellow, uh, uh, shall we say uh, a bit of a partier, a uh, womanizer, uh, and all around just a fun man. Uh, he was uh, known in baseball parlance at that time as crafty. Now, crafty in those days would be called a cheater nowadays. Uh, he threw screwballs and spitballs and scuff balls and any other kind of pitch that would not be legal at all in baseball today. But these pitches had so much movement on them that no catcher could handle them, except for Bucky. Now, Bucky and Delmont become fast friends, and they end up barnstorming up and down the Atlantic coast every summer for three summers. And it is fantastic. But at the end of that third summer, in the beginning of September, Bucky gets called into the manager's office, which is never a good thing because this is the time of year when players' contracts are terminated. And Bucky uh, fears the worst. So does Delmont. And so Bucky goes in to face the manager and Delmont paces back and forth outside like a father with a kid in surgery. And Bucky walks out solemn, head dropped low. And Delmont fears the worst and puts his arm around his best friend and says, it's all right, Buck, we've had a great run. And Bucky, head down, says, you're right, Dell. it has been a good run. I'm gonna miss you in Pittsburgh. And the word Pittsburgh floated out of his mouth like a thundercloud of joy above this locker room. But it just hung there for a minute because no one really understood what he said. And then Bucky starts to laugh, a low chuckle, but that chuckle starts to build and build until it's uproarious laughter. And then some of the other guys in the locker room finally realize what he said. They realize the word they heard, Pittsburgh. And they started to hoot and holler. And now the whole locker room's up in arms and Delmont finally realizes what he says. And he says, Bucky, you son of a... And Bucky goes and gives him a big bear hug. And there was much celebration in the locker room that night and many beverages had. And the next morning, Bucky and Delmont, both a little worse for wear. Delmont drives Bucky to the bus station so he can start his Major League Baseball career. And on the way there, uh, Bucky and, Dom and Delmont talked about their three years together and, and how much fun they'd had on the road and how they'd always stay in touch. And Bucky gave Delmont his most valued possession, a piece of that buckskin glove. And so since this is a tall tale, I should tell you, 
uh, that uh, Bucky had a great major league career and he never had to work in the mines again, but that would be a lie. Uh, in real life, because this is a true story, uh, Bucky was a bullpen catcher for 15 games in September. He never got a major league at bat. He never showed up in a major league box score. He was the equivalent of a major league ghost. Hmm. And he never played major league baseball again. Through a series of unfortunate events and tragedies, uh, when Bucky went back to the mine in October, there had been uh, an explosion and a union strike and a broken hip and a number of other things that prevented Bucky from ever playing organized baseball again. And maybe the biggest tragedy of all was that he lost touch with his best friend, Delma. And so years later, decades later, because Bucky lived a long life, and by this point, most people called him Gramp because he was in his late 90s and had great grandchildren, or late 80s, and had great grandchildren. But he lived with his beloved daughter, Elsie. And uh, he came into the kitchen nook one morning and he said, Elsie, you're never going to believe what happened last night. I woke up in the middle of the night and Delmont is sitting right in my favorite chair. And now Elsie uh, is familiar with her dad's, uh, we'll say tall tales, whoppers, big fish, whatever you want to say. Bucky was a natural storyteller. So she plays along and she says, oh, really? How was Delmont doing? And Bucky said, oh, he's doing great. I got to tell him about you. I told him about the grandkids. I told him about uh, Jenny and Charlie. And it was just great. We just got to BS like the old days. <clears throat> and so now Elsie's in hook, line and sinker. And she says, oh, well, you know, she's teasing him a little bit. What did, uh, what did Delmont talk about? And Bucky goes, ha! Same thing Delmont always talks about. What do you think he talked about? He talked about women. He talked about booze. He talked about baseball. He talked about the goddamn Pittsburgh Pirates. And so uh, Elsie says, oh, well, if Delmont's still here, should I make some tea for him? And Bucky goes, no, of course he's not here. You know, I asked him. The sun started to come up. I asked him if he wanted to stay for breakfast. Delmont said, no, I got to get going. I said, well, what the hell did you come all the way down here for if you're just going to get going before breakfast? Delmont said he had to bring me something. And then, bearing at that moment, the phone rang. And like so many times in our lives, uh, you make choices that seem minuscule and meaningless. But Elsie answers the phone. And the rest of that conversation gets drop, dropped. Uh, Bucky finishes his breakfast, goes out in the garden, does some gardening. He loves his garden. Elsie has her phone conversation. And just like every other day, Bucky sits down to take his afternoon nap about 1.30, and he never wakes up. And uh, Elsie finds that he had passed away peacefully in his bed. But the odd thing was, when she found him, laid out at the foot of his bed, and with great intention, was a box. And when Elsie opened the box, inside was a pair of well-worn buckskin gloves, the left one fashioned into a catcher's mitt. Okay. Thank you, Jason. That was wonderful, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, so uh, your, your bio is incomplete. I'm just going to have to get some clarification. Which housemate scratches the furniture? Uh, that would be, uh, well, uh, depending on the day, it's usually <laughs> Maggie which is the uh, one of the cats, but oh, sometimes okay. it's Harrison. You never know. And he's the kid. You never know. Right. Uh, and uh, let's see. now how old is Harrison? Harrison will be six at the end of the month. Okay. And this is the most important question. Is Harrison allowed to listen to Wu-Tang since he's, you know, a kid? Uh, you know, uh, Wu-Tang is for the children. I know. And, it, and it's important to uh, make sure that children are exposed to a wide variety of music. As a child, I listened to a lot of uh, Beatles and Doors and the Rolling Stones. And it's only right that my child is, has to suffer through listening to what I liked as a teenager <laughs> and 20 year old. <laughs> okay, that's a good choice, man. Uh, that's beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, um, man. Uh, Jason, everybody, one more uh, air applause for Jason. And now I have other copy to read to you. Um, uh, oh. This is not just copy. This is an, another introduction. I'm very excited. Uh, I want to introduce a judge. The judges shall be introduced. And we love our judges. This is the opposite of baseball umpires. Um, 
uh, this is uh, JJ Sheffer. Am I pronouncing that right, JJ? Yes, sir. Good. I'm I'm uh, I'm terrified about that. Uh, JJ is the producer of York Story Slam, York Crafted, and several other arts and humanities programs in York County, Pennsylvania, that focus on story, story, storytelling. JJ, do you have anything to say for yourself? Just that I think we're off to a great start. I'm really enjoying this so far. Good. Glad to be here. Very sweet. Well, thank you so much for uh, uh, stepping up and judging and for all you do for storytelling. That's exciting. I will now introduce our next storyteller, whether the judges are ready or not. I'm not even going to ask anymore. Okay, here we go. Um, David Mayer Smith. Uh, David Mayer Smith grew up in central Pennsylvania, where storyteller was what you called a liar when you were trying to be polite. Dave has been a storyteller all his life. Some of those stories are being collected into a show called This Is Not a Documentary, premiering in Philadelphia this fall. And uh, please welcome David Mayer Smith. Well, good evening, everybody. Gather around, and I'm going to take you all back in time, way, way back to a time called the 1980s. <laughs> Now, I know we're supposed to be telling lies here, but <clears throat> personally, I just can't bring myself to sink so low. So I have a story for you. And if you feel that it's important that it be a lie, well, please feel free to refuse to believe it. I'm getting kind of used to that. Back in the 1980s, I used to travel around a lot making documentary films. And wherever we go, we try and find some local food or some local color because if you've seen one ramada in bar you've seen them all one night we found ourselves in a little town called ashland pennsylvania up in schuylkill county we made our way to a little corner bar that looked like it had been there since the beginning of time there was a fella at the bar looked like he'd been on that stool since he inherited it from his daddy who got it from his daddy we sat down at a table and sent one of the guys to the bar for a couple of pitchers of beer. And he asked what kind. And I said, don't worry, they'll tell you. Cause it was a, <laughs> it was a one tap, one tap kind of joint. You know what I mean? And we were too far East for iron city. So it was going to be Schmitz unless it was a holiday weekend. And then it'd be Pabst blue ribbon, but we weren't that lucky. Now, if you've ever been in a bar like that, you know, that you get the hairy eyeball from the locals till they figure out whether or not you're trouble. And I don't think we look like much of a threat, so everybody went back to their beer. There was a pool table in the back that was doing some business and a jukebox playing, honest to God, 45 RPM records. And you young folks, ask your grandparents what those are. I don't think those records have been swapped out since Eisenhower was president. So we got to hear some Marty Robbins and Ray Price and Johnny Cash. And there was an old dartboard that looked like a woodpecker had been at it. Wasn't a lot left in the middle to aim at. So we sat at our table and drank our beer and told our stories. Now, film crews have the best stories. But the problem is... When you work with the same guys over and over and over, you hear the same stories over and over and over. So we're always on the lookout for a new tale to tell. And that's what we got that night. The bartender came over to get the pictures and asked what we were doing in town. And we told him we were a film crew look, looking for or working on a documentary about Pennsylvania coal mining. And the bartender says, Oh, you want to talk to old Rudy Moss? And he yells into the back, Hey, Rudy, get out here! Well, this old fella comes out of the back, and he and the bartender talk for a minute, and then comes over to our table and sits down. It looks to be on the far side of a hundred. He's wearing his dirty old navy blue jumpsuit with the name Rudy in a white oval over his heart. And he doesn't have a lot of teeth. So we have to listen very carefully to understand him. He says, My name's Rudy Moss. 
I'm the last survivor of the great Schuylkill County mine disaster of 1911 that killed over a hundred men and boys and wiped out the town of Flood. Don't go looking for it on any map. It ain't there no more. For a beer and a tenner, I'll tell you all about it. Well, we couldn't believe our luck. For 10 bucks, we we're going to get a first-hand account of an honest-to-God mine disaster. So we poured Rudy a beer and set two fives on the table, and he started talking. I was a breaker boy working up top, but that day they put me down in the bottom of the hole to work the belt with old Tooney Shea, because we was the only boys tall enough who still had all ten fingers. Deep in the mine were four fellas I knew pretty good from town. There was Shawnee Malone, off the boat from County Cary. Hard worker, that Shawnee. When he weren't in the hole, he was working at the butchers or loading railroad cars. And there was Jaime the Jew, who weren't Jewish, but he was too small a feller to make an argument about it when somebody called him that. And Jakey Yoder, an ex-Amishman out of Lancaster County who shaved off his beard and couldn't never go home. And Enzo. Enzo Tati. Enzo was a stonecutter from a family of stonecutters going all the way back to the Romans. He had come over and the only stone they let him cut here was in the bottom of a coal mine. They was all short fellas, you know. So they put them all the way down in the mine to clear out the slate before the timbermen come through and shore up the roof. And between them and me was about a hundred other fellas. That seam of coal had played out and we was pulling mostly slate out of the mine. They was hoping to break on through to a new seam. Rudy stopped for a second, took a big swig of his beer, and told the rest of the story looking down at his feet, not making much eye contact with the rest of us. I don't know how it happened. Maybe somebody took out the wrong pillar or clipped a bolt. But it ain't like you see in the movies with all the dirt and rocks coming down. In a real mine collapse, one second you got a tunnel, and the next you got a wall of rock. I was lucky. I got on the first skip up out of the mine. But you don't know what scared is till you're half a mile underground and the walls start shaking. As they was pulling me up, I looked down and I see brothers crawling over brothers and fathers clawing at sons trying to get out. I seen 20 guys try to crawl up a ladder made for two. And it all come down on top of them. There were 128 chips on the board that day. That's one chip for every man who went down in that hole. That's 128 souls down that mine, and 15 come out. The four boys I told you about got caught on the other side of a million tons of rock. They was scrambling looking for a vent or a hole or any way out of the bottom of that mine, and they didn't find nothing. They was trapped. So after a while, they sits down and gets to talking and waiting for a rescue crew to come and dig them out. Enzo said he missed the sea and how blue it was and the heat of the sun in his grandfather's olive grove. And when he gets out, he's going back to Italy and even if they won't let him cut stone, he'll pick olives. Jakey couldn't ever go home. His Amish family had shunned him. But he'd been reading about Montana and how they could stake you to a little plot of land and a small herd of cattle. And when he got out of that mine, that's where he'd want to spend his days, out under the big sky. Jaime missed his mama. Mama gave him the money to come over and he was supposed to work and bring her along. But Jaime met a girl and got married. And they had a little girl and... 
Jaime said, when they get me out of here, I'm bringing Mama over. I don't care how much it costs. She's gonna meet her granddaughter, Hannah. Shawnee missed County Kerry. He missed his ma and his da, but mostly he missed his girl, Molly. He had enough money now. He could get a little plot of land back in Ireland with some cows. Shawnee had learned to make cheese and thought that'd be a pretty good living, making cheese to sell in the shops at Dingle and Killarney. After a while, their lamps burned down and they sat there in the dark. And you don't know what dark is till you've been down a mine. All your life you've had some light coming to you from somewhere, but in a mine the dark takes on a life of its own. It's almost like you can feel the darkness, like it's alive. And sometimes you think it moves. And it's so quiet down there. And when it gets that quiet, you can hear your own heartbeat thundering in your ears. And your own breath is like the howling of the wind. And you want it to go away, you want it to stop, but you can't stop listening because you desperately want to hear the crash of metal on stone. You desperately want to hear the calls of the men saying, hold on, we're coming for you. So you wait there in a hole miles from sunlight, feeling the darkness move around you and slowly being driven mad by the thunder of your own heartbeat. That's when Rudy got up, finished his beer, grabbed the money off the table, handed five to the bartender, then turned back to us and said, you know, the company don't do no recovery if there's no more coal in the mine. So them boys, they're down there still. And he walked out of the bar. Well, we couldn't believe how lucky we were to get a story like this for our documentary. We talked for the rest of the night how we could shoot an interview with Rudy and fit it into the story we were already telling. And it wasn't until the next morning that we realized that we'd been had. And in that little town of Ashland, Pennsylvania, we had all been fooled by a world-class liar. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Give it up. It was lovely. Um, thank you, David. Thank you so much. Um, a different mood. Uh, now, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, for real, man. Uh, what your, <laughs> your, your documentary, where's that going to be? It's in Philly, right? Uh, boy, that was, we shot that back in the eighties. I think that's, pl that's playing at a museum somewhere. Oh, okay. Up in, uh, up in Schuylkill County, if it's still around. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to be telling stories somewhere um, in Philadelphia. Uh, this is doc this is not a documentary. Is that uh, the the this is not a documentary? It's a collection of the stories that I tell. And yeah, this is this is one of them. Oh, okay. And w and you're going to be doing that in Philly sometime. Yeah. Oh, where where in Philly do you do you know the venue? A venue to be determined. To <laughs> I've done that in my time. Yes, to be <laughs> determined. Uh, I I love Philadelphia, so I can you know often guess where it's going to be. Um, and uh, so, are, do you still make documentary films? I do. Yes. Very cool. All right. Well, keep it up. Um, Thank you. Um, and uh, once again, I am obliged, according to my script, to uh, describe audience voting. If you've joined us late. And some of you may have, and if you have, we welcome you. We're so delighted that you're here. Um, I'm not watching texts or uh, or comings or goings or anything because I'm not that smart. Um, I and I have to wear a head, you know, headsets to do that and be important. Um, please vote. Don't vote until all the performers are done. You'll have seven minutes to cast your vote for the lie or liar you like best. The audience vote, along with judges' scores, determines the winner. Honor system one vote per person please look for the link in the chat or go to susquehanna folk.org slash vote good 
Um, any questions? Don't ask because I can't hear you. All right. Um, and now it's time to uh, da, 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 um, uh, uh, to in introduce Lorena Bergvist. And I said that wrong, I'm sure, but she's going to be kind to me. Um, uh, Lorena Bergvist is bilingual. She's a dual citizen with one foot in the U.S. and the other foot in Sweden. After spending 30 years as a dedicated story listener, Lorena made the leap to becoming a storyteller. She now proudly displays, displays her master's degree in storytelling and has constantly discovering and is constantly discovering new ways to tell old stories. Please welcome Lorena. Hi, Lorena. Hi. I live in Sweden. And people here love to go for walks in the forest. Me too. We have almost 70% of the land in Sweden is forest. That's a lot, a lot of forest if you want to go for a walk. You could walk for hours and not meet another person if you didn't want to. Well, I was ready for my daily walk in the forest. I grabbed my backpack and I packed in it a bottle of lemonade, lemonade like grandpa made that special recipe. And then two freshly baked cinnamon buns. Oh, sugarly, del sugarly delight. Oh, I was ready. Grabbed the backpack, headed out the door and followed the winding path through the forest. I passed the magnificent oak trees, the slender silvery birch trees, the willows hanging with their feet almost touching the brook. I could hear the birds chirping in the trees and I felt my stress just melt away. I could relax. Okay, someone's walking their dog, that's okay. And I looked, you know how it is when there are two cars passing on a one lane highway? So I, it was that narrow on the path. So I, I found a picnic table and I stood next to it and I waited for the dog to, and its owner to come past. And as I'm waiting, I'm watching for it to come and the barking is getting louder, <laughs> louder and louder. And then I see it come through the trees and there was no leash and no owner and it's running straight toward me. I jump onto the seat of the picnic table. My heart is pounding and it comes closer and closer and I see it's a wolf, not a dog. And I jump on top of the picnic table and it takes a flying leap when it gets next to me. I managed to sidestep it and it flies right past me over the whole picnic table. I look around and there is a branch from an oak tree. I grab onto that branch and I pull myself up. <sighs> Just as I'm sitting on the branch, ah, there is pulling on my leg. I can feel that I'm pulling my leg and then I kick and the wolf has his teeth in my shoe. I managed somehow to kick and pull my leg up. So now I have both legs on top of the branch. My arm is wrapped around the trunk and I am sitting frantically thinking, what do I do? How can I outsmart a wolf? There must be something. What do humans have that wolves don't? Smartphones. Of course, I reach into my pocket and I pull out my iPhone. There must be something on here I can use to outsmart the wolf. And I open it and I start scrolling through my apps. What could it be? What could it be? Ah, Spotify, not premium. I didn't pay for premium, but Spotify. They say that music soothes the savage beast. Maybe, maybe it would work. It's worth trying. I'm sitting up in a tree, so let's try. And I click to play. And after the ads, I choose a song I held it close enough. The, the wolf is still jumping at the tree, growling. And, and so I don't hold it close enough that they can bite my arm, but close enough it can hear volume up. Ain't nothing but a hound dog crying all the time. <laughs> Not an Elvis fan, really? Okay, we'll try another one. And I quickly look, playlist, what do I have? What do I have? Oh, trying. Okay, this one, this one might do it. Who let the dogs out? Who, 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 who let the dogs out? Now it stands up on its hind legs and starts clawing the bark on the tree. Huh, picky, aren't you? Okay. And then I ask myself, wait, wait, calm, think. Think, what do I listen to when I want to relax? And I look, I actually have an app. I actually have a playlist and it says Mozart for relaxation. There you go. And I click. And it plays the dulcet tones of Mozart fill the air. And like magic, the wolf calms down. It lays down at the base of the tree, puts its head on its paw, relaxes its tail and its ears and looks up at me. Hmm, 
Oh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Ah. And I'm standing there holding the phone, keeping the Mozart going. And I hear, help me. This is not true. You cannot be talking to me. Help me. I need your help. And I look at the wolf. Are you talking to me? I'm talking to you. What is it you want? You need to help me. You see, I'm really a prince and I've been cursed to look like a wolf. And you're the only one who can break the curse. Yeah, I'm not gonna buy this. And there is no kiss involved in this. Um, no. It says, please help me. I said, what do you need? I need some of that lemonade, lemonade like grandpa made. I know you got it. Okay, it's true. I've got that lemonade. My grandpa, <sighs> and I'm looking at him going, this could be the big bad wolf lying to me just to get me out of the tree and kill me and eat me up. But I decided to trust him. And I dismounted from the tree with all the grace and elegance of a 12 year old gymnast <laughs> in my mind, in my mind. And there I stood holding the phone and getting out the lemonade bottle and opening it and I poured it in my left hand. My hands were shaking. This could be the end of me. I can't believe I was going to trust the wolf and pour lemonade. And I looked over at that wolf, he had this curly black hair on top and he looked vicious. Oh, oh, my heart is pounding. My hand is full of lemonade. I drop my phone, forget Mozart, and I walk forward and it opens its mouth. I can smell its wolf breath and I see those sharp teeth and I think, okay, this is gonna be the end. And I hold out my hand and it starts to lick. It licks up all of the lemonade and I back up. Ugh. And in a poof of smoke, the wolf disappears and in his place is standing you are not a prince. You are Prince, the artist formerly known as Prince. He smiles at me, puts out his hand and starts to sing. You don't have to be rich to be my girl. You don't have to be cool to rule my world. No particular sign I'm compatible with. <gasps> The sun feels like a giant disco ball sending shimmering shards of color throughout the forest. And there I am dancing and singing with Prince, the artist formerly known as Prince. And I do a magnificent dance move spinning around. And I see we are surrounded. All the wild animals of the forest are surrounding us. <sighs> singing harmony. Is this like a Disney movie? Wait. What if they also need lemonade, lemonade like grandpa made? And I look at the animals. Okay. I grab a leaf off the ground and I pour in some more lemonade and another leaf and another leaf and I keep pouring until it's gone. But the animals rush over and they start lapping up the lemonade as fast as they can. And some of them look up to me pleading. I'm sorry, it's, it's empty. Do you want a cinnamon bun? No, okay. Well, as they look at me with these pleading looks, I, I explain, I said, but you know, I come for a walk in the forest every day to relax. I'll be back tomorrow. And if you want, I will bring another bottle of that lemonade, lemonade like grandpa made. I know you want it. And we'll party like it's 1999. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lorena, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, uh, it's Bergvist. Pronounce your name. Just do it for me. Bergvist. <laughs> I knew you'd say something like that. Um, okay. So uh, you, 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 uh, uh, my watch has stopped. What time is it? It is 1.48 a.m. It Where is you? really late for me. I do have a 20-year-old son who uh -huh. is waiting up with me. And he said, Mom, this is not late. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all depending on your age. For me, this is really late. <laughs> right. And and you have have both feet in, on, you know, in a citizen, you're a dual citizen, you have both feet. Yes. In, uh, and that, that must be quite a stretch. Like it a 12 year old is. gymnast, it right? <laughs> it is. Uh, the grace and elegance of a 12 year old gymnast, in my mind, anyway. Cool. Where did you get your master's? In East, East Tennessee State University. East Tennessee State University. All yes. right. That's what I thought. Okay. I mean, yeah. that was, that was one of three guesses I had in the United States anyway. Where were the other ones? <laughs> Boone and uh, Kennesaw State in Georgia. Okay. 
Well, yeah. I was uh, in the class. I have lots of wonderful classmates and my professors and it was wonderful. And they're watching now. And no, that's that's the premier place. You know, <laughs> to get a master's in storytelling in the United States. That, that's it. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, let's give it up one more time. Yay. And now I'm going to to do another introduction because we have another judge. And um, this is uh, Mina Edmondson, who will now share her screen. There she is. She is, that is a photograph. She's not just a still person. Um, Mina has her dream job. She is the director of the Martin Library in downtown York, PA. She thrives on the energy of the city of York. I've heard a lot about that. Story Slams provide her with opportunities to connect with the community. Mina, do you have anything to say for yourself? Or is she not um, audible? That may be the case. But anyway, there's our slide of Mina. Um, thank you so much, Mina, for, for helping us out. We appreciate it so much. All right. Now, our next storyteller is Sandy Schumann. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Just a minute. You know when you're using a dock and you touch it wrong and it wants to edit and it, it it goes up and down? You don't care. You just don't care, do you? What I've suffered today, you don't care. Focus, Andy. All right, good. We care. Sit. Oh, good, thanks. Sandy Schumann is fascinated by familiar things and their unfamiliar stories. He brings folk tales and historical sagas to life. Parentheses. Some of our folklore is truly unbelievable and some of our history is even more so and reveals the little known stories behind some of our best known songs. When you hear him play the guitar and sing, you'll know why he calls himself a storyteller. Please welcome Sandy Schumann. Hi, Sandy. Hi there. Uh, I, I've had a very busy day and uh, I, got, I was interviewed, uh, a new reporter working for the Harrisburg newspaper, the Patriot News. Um, they were assigned to do a series on philanthropy and they wanted to interview me and the first thing out of this reporter's mouth in the interview is how did you get to be so rich and uh i, I thought that was rather abrupt uh, and, and it kind of threw me a little bit but i i said well uh back in the yo-yo craze uh i invented the single disc double string yo-yo. And I got such a look of confusion, I figured that this young person wasn't alive in the yo-yo craze and they didn't know what I was talking about. So I, I did a little face-saving thing. I said, you know, some of your readers might not be familiar with the yo-yo. It's a simple toy. It's it's just two discs about two and a half inches in diameter and they're they're right next to each other with a space in between about quarter inch and they're connected by an axle. And you see, you take a, a string, a long string and you double it over. So there's a loop at, at the one end and then you twist the string so it acts like one string. And then you put that loop over the yo-yo so the axle is sitting in that loop and you wind the string around the yo-yo and then what you can do is you see you hold the end of the string and you throw the yo-yo down and it'll it'll just unravel the string and when it gets to the bottom of that loop it'll just spin around that's called the sleeper trick and then when you're ready you just jerk your hand a little bit and it climbs back up the string and then you can do it over and over again playing yo-yo and you can do all kinds of tricks. Well, you see, my invention was to take a single disc and put a, an axle right through it. So you had the axle sticking out both sides. You wind a string around each side of the axle, and then you can throw the yo-yo with two hands. And when you want to bring it up, you jerk your hands. And you know, using two hands like that, you get a more powerful thing. Now, Here's the real wonderful part of this. If you hold your hands like this, with your thumbs pointing in opposite directions and you do the yo-yo that way, well, that works really well, but what's the best is that you can do it sideways. 
And that brings out a whole new range of yo-yo tricks. Well, I saw the reporter was writing furiously, taking notes. I think she was catching on. And then she asked me this question. She said, how did you ever think up that idea? Now, that is a question I really like. Not every interviewer will ask it. And I told her, well, ever since I was a kid, I, I've always been enamored with the grand scenic view. You know, like you get off a of blue mountain west of uh, Harrisburg or, or south of Harrisburg, there's the, the Ridge Overlook Trail. Is it? I can never remember. Is it the Ridge Overlook Trail, the Overlook Ridge Trail? I always get them. Anyway, great views. And, and I, I began to appreciate the effort that people with foresight had made to clear out the trees so you could actually see the view. And I thought I should do my part in scenic view development. And so for example, north of Harrisburg on the Appalachian Trail, I was hiking there one day and I came up to Hawk Rock and I said, you know, there ought to be a really great view here of the Susquehanna Valley. And so I took it upon myself to clear out all those trees that were obstructing the view and behold, it is a grand view. If you haven't been there, you ought to. It's, it's, it's worth the hike, it's great. And uh, I, it was a lot of work. And I thought now, instead of climbing down from where the view ought to be and, and climbing down and then cutting the trees to clear the view, wouldn't it be great if you could just do it from up there where the view ought to be? And so I took a circular saw blade, 15 inch circular saw blade, and I, I threw it like a Frisbee. And if you put a good enough spin on it, it'll fly into the trunk of the tree and, and, and make a cut. Now, you could use up a lot of saw blades that way. So you tie a rope through the center hole of the circular saw blade. And then when you throw the saw blade Frisbee-like, you can pull it back. So you've got to do it, you've got to manage the rope with your left hand while you're frisbeeing the circular saw blade with your right hand. You've got to be careful. If you're not careful, you could cut off your left hand. I'm, I'm right-handed, so I do it this way. You could cut your left hand off, and if that happened, they'd have to stitch it back on, and you'd end up with stitches and a scar around your hand like I've got here. So you've got to be careful. Well, after I mastered the frisbee technique, I had another idea. I thought, well, if I put a dowel through the center hole of that circular saw, I'd have that dowel sticking out both sides. I wrap a rope around each side and I develop this circular saw yo-yo technique. And I, like I showed you before with your thin thumbs on opposite sides, you yo-yo it out and you do the sleeper trick. So it does some cutting and then you bring it back and you yoga it out again, it's much faster than the Frisbee technique. You've got to be careful though, when you bring it back, that you don't bring it back so far because you could cut your head off and then you'd have stitches around your neck and a scar like I've got here. So you've got to be careful. Now, I suppose it doesn't take a, a lot of imagination to make the connection between my yo-yoing circular saw technique for grand scenic view development and understand how that led to the invention of the single disc double string yo-yo, which is how I made my fortune. Now, if you've already mastered the Frisbee technique or the yo-yo technique of scenic view development, uh, you can apply for a grant from my foundation, the uh, Grand Scenic View Development Foundation.org. It's not .com, it's .org. And uh, if you haven't learned the technique, you can apply for the app apprenticeship program. The applications are right there on my website, www.grandscenicviewdevelopment.org. I'd be delighted to hear from you. Thank you. All right. Zandy Schumann, yay. Let me see fingers. I need to see fingers. All right, everybody, fingers. Thank you, Shan Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, uh, you, you're a you're a backstory collector, aren't you? I get that feeling with with your history stuff. A what story collector? Backstory. You like the backstory, backstory. to history? Oh yeah, yeah. 
it's all about the backstory. Um, I was just curious about that. And um, what what has been your day job? Well, uh, the truth, the truth. I always tell the truth, even if I have to lie. To of course. It. And I always say that. <laughs> yeah, and, and I like this question because I get to say that I facilitated collaborative problem solving and decision making. Uh, I practiced a lot. So that kind of rolls off my tongue. That is that is a, a beautiful roll off the tongue thing to say. Right, right, right. right. Well, well, thank you for and you're are you in the mountains right now? Are you on in a mountain range? I'm, I'm in front of a picture of a mountain. I'm not disappointed to learn that. I, I'm just glad it, there wasn't an avalanche. I was worried it would fall. Yeah, that'd be a problem. All right. Well, thank you, Sandy Schumann. Yay. Fingers. I'm going to see the fingers. Susan, land out. I need to see your fingers. All right, good. Um, I am uh, on my list of things that I'm supposed to do as an MC is once again describing the um, – uh point system and how we do it ready here we go take i'm going to see if i can do it in one breath <gasps> at the end of tail tabbing you'll have seven minutes to cast your vote seven minutes to cast for the liar okay i've breathed it's already over for the liar or the lie you like best audience vote along with judges scores determines the winner honor system one vote per viewer um look for the link or the chat to go susquehanna folk.org slash vote i just love to see the word slash spelled out and i appreciate that because Sometimes I would blow that and um, uh, dots not spelled out, but slash is, and I would, I would trip up on that. So that's, that's important. All right. Our next storyteller is Ken Parsons. Ken Parsons is a rhyming storyteller from Newfoundlandon, Labrador, Canada. He says, quote, we have a history in our province of writing and sharing recitations, rhyming stories, with usually a humorous slant. Ken is a writer teller of rural legends, also known as lies, about a small outport town called Raisin Arm. Please welcome Ken Parsons. Perfect. Uh, adios, good, I hope. I, years ago, in well, in a small town in rural Newfoundland, there was a gentleman who was well known for, well, not bathing, not washing. He, um, yeah, he, he was well known for that. And what happened, he passed away. And when the traveling uh, minister, because the town was so small, they didn't have their own clergy. When the traveling minister came to the town, he asked the locals, you know, getting ready for a service, how this man died. And the, uh, the response, uh, so it comes from my mother, is that, well, sir, uh, we know as he didn't drown. <laughs> so uh, I did some research and found out exactly how he died. And, and here's the story of uh, Patty McBride. In a town of Raisin Arm, when a baby is born, well, there's lots of hot water and toil. Uh, but Patty McBride wasn't keen to be birthed and then clean and was born before the water was boiled. Uh, he had a great fear of, well, washing my dear but he was a nice youngster said father a and whatever the opposite of an attraction is called well that would be patty in water <laughs> and it wasn't no laugh giving young patty a bath sure it was like some mad bear had gone loose and someone had snapped all his paws in a trap and another had pulled out his tooth so the mcbride family did all they could for their kid but with water kind of out of their reach uh, it was an annual thing they would do every spring. Uh, they would scrub them with sand from the beach. Now, time, it just flew. And as young Patty grew, well, his mother kept washcloths nearby. But no matter where she'd find them or try to sneak up behind them, <laughs> Patty managed to always stay dry. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. How's he lemonade drinking when he hates to feel his skin wet? Well, he'll take a big draw on about an 11 foot straw uh, because that's about as close as he gets. And you'd have to be in a coma, <laughs> not to smell that aroma. Oh, you, you could tell when Patty was near because uh, your stomach would urge and your eyes would converge if he got, say, within a gunshot of here. But 
Petty often went out and wandered about. <laughs> Wind direction, that was his trick. But one time out around, oh, the breeze died right down and nine local pigs got real sick. Petty didn't attend school. He was nobody's fool. His mind was ahead of his station. See, when the wind blew offshore, well, they threw books through his door. It was the first use of distance education. And from a mail order college, well, young Petty gained knowledge about the wind and the rain and the tide. And there was no one knew better about all kinds of weather than smelly old Petty McBride. If you wanted to know if it was wet or dry snow or the tide would come slower or faster, well, he just hoist up a flag. He had a bunch in the bag, like a long distance weather forecaster. But come that terrible day, when the sea pulled away, sure, Petty knew just what that meant. The whole town must be saved from a watery grave, so he decided to let loose his full scent. Sure, up he arose and stripped off all his clothes, and he went to each and every house and around. Oh, it was too much to take, and for their own safety's sake, well, the entire population left town. <laughs> and as the last person ran from the smell of that man, well, a, a loud rumble came up from the bay. See, Patty's no swami, uh, but he knew a tsunami was headed directly their way. And, you know, his mother couldn't be prouder when that mountain of water buried her son in that town. Because if it weren't for the smell of that awful brave fella, well, hundreds of souls would be drowned. But now, Patty couldn't be saved from that monstrous wave, and he died, but not from the water that flowed. It was just the thought of his skin being neat as a pin that made Patty's poor heart explode. <laughs> but what a big heart he had, this courageous young lad, to stand up to his fears like he'd done. And he took on that wave so the town could be saved. Well, there's a hero if ever there's one. So when when all hands came back from that tsunami attack, well, Patty's washed body was found. Mm -hmm. And for over eight seasons, well, <laughs> Patty McBride, he's the reason that Bonavista Bay is dark brown. You know, they held a parade as they marched to his grave to celebrate this kind introvert. But uh, weren't no casket, you know, so he was buried just in his clothes. They put Patty back home in the dirt. Now, if you got either doubt of what this story's about, well, there's proof uh, Patty's had the last laugh because way, well, on the top of Jiggin Hill, <laughs> that mark is there still. It's the ring of dirt uh, from Patty's last bath. True story. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ken. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Ken, uh, did did I pronounce Newfoundland Newfoundland correctly? The Newfoundland, yes, sir. <laughs> did I good? And I want to make sure I correct. Uh, I, I pronounce everything correctly and have everything correctly spelled. Um, <laughs> raisin arm. Um, did I did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, sir. You and, you got it. And how is raisin arm spelled? As in, as in dried grapes, R-A-I-S-I-A. Okay, I thought it was a misprint, and uh, I was concerned, um, <laughs> and, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, offend. Oh, not uh, at all. But if I offend, I want to do it on purpose, and I don't want to offend by accident. So, uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Is that is that is that your house you're in front of there? Uh, it is a uh, a fishing stage. It's a photo of a fishing stage from uh, from Newfoundland. You can see some lobster pots down there in the corner, and uh, uh, yeah. You'll see a lot of colorful houses and fishing stages in uh, Newfoundland when you come visit. <laughs> cool. All right. I need to make my way there. All right. Thank you so much, Ken Parsons. One more time. Yes. <sighs> All right. Now I have to make another judge introduction. I don't even want to read this. Um, Miss Sheila Arnold. <sighs> Miss Sheila, are you there? She there? Oh, what? I only get a. I only get a card? Good grief, Sheila, you slack dog. All right, Miss Sheila is a full-time traveling storyteller and creator of Histories Alive, 
Um, she has a passion, vision, and a ministry of healing hearts, unifying communities, and reminding people to share their stories. And I have to um, uh, be forthright and tell you that Sheila is one of my best road pals. That's why I'm being so silly. Um, and uh, 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 she's not telling you this, and it's not in her bio, but it ought to be. Sheila is um, <clears throat> a history fellow of Mount Vernon. And I'm not talking about Mount Vernon, in Ohio, and I'm not talking about Mount Vernon in the northern part of Atlanta, but um, Georgie and Maggie's house um, in Virginia. And uh, I guess I thought I would be able to hear these people. Sheila, do you have anything to say for yourself? Georgie and Maggie? Uh, you know, well, that's just, if you know them really well, that's what you call them. <laughs> it is great to be here and it's been so much fun, everyone. And so thank you for the opportunity to come and thank you for a great, uh, great evening. So thank you. Thanks for helping us, Miss Sheila. Love you, dear. I'll talk to you later. All right. I have, I have work to do. Um, uh, let me, I'm fix this so I can read it. And it did that thing again and bear with me. And you guys are bared with me so well today. Uh, Leslie Shelley grew up on a family farm in the foothills of North Georgia, where she still lives today. Telling stories was just part of life, and she was blessed to be surrounded with wise women, proud men, and more than her share of big fibbers. Shelley believes the spoken word and a shared look is something more powerful than just about anything. She loves to tell and listen to people sharing life. Please welcome Leslie Shelley. Hello, hello, everybody. Um, I did grow up on a farm in the foothills of North Georgia, where I still live. And this story, you know, I lived it. So it's going to be a stretch for it to be a fib. But my grandmother ruled the family. And on Sundays in the South, when I was little, everybody congregated at her house. And when I say everybody, she raised six of her own children and their spouses who she tolerated were invited and all 18 of us grandkids and my grandpa. So Sunday morning for her started before daylight. And this Sunday, she's standing at the kitchen sink and she was filling up that coffee pot under that faucet just kind of leaned against the cabinet not awake yet and for a minute there she thought there was going to be an onset of ache and arthritis I mean her fingers were stiff and her forearms sore all the way up to the elbow but as she pondered on it it was those lemons she had traded fresh eggs the day before for a beautiful bag of lemons see in North Georgia the closest we got to lemon juice was green pawpaws so it was a rare treat and she had squeezed them all by hand and made the best lemonade for Sunday lunch. But at that moment, as the coffee pot filled up, she shut the faucet off. Well, right out the window, down at the edge of the field, just this side of the riverbank, the sun started making its way up behind the trees. And that sunrise was coming up blood red. At that moment, she had a foreboding while the hair on the back of her head just kind of tangled. And she knew it was coming on yesterday because she'd gone to Lula Mae's for a fresh body wave and a trim. And Lula Mae had a new girl she was a training who had swept up her trimmed hair for my grandma could put it in her paper poke because everybody knows, I know you all know, she brought every trimmed piece home with her and buried it under the rock at the edge of the garden to hold off bad luck and bad headaches. Well, she came home all upset. That night, that night she'd slept with her shoes turned upside down under the edge of the bed and a knife under the pillow to cut the pain, but it was coming on. And she kind of pushed back from that kitchen sink and while that sunrise, it was just covering the sky and the old sycamore tree the tallest tree in the front pasture. Why, it looked like two hands raised up to the heavens, stretched up there. Now, my grandma, this always worried me just a little. She had an imaginary friend. And there were times in life when she talked to that imaginary friend. And in that moment, she stood there with that foreboding full on her, looking at that blood red sunrise in that sycamore tree. She said, Lord, Lord, 
Oh, Lord, I give you my troubles. And she wasn't a lazy woman, not not prone to lingering. So she commenced to doing everything that had to be done. You know, frying chicken, putting on about five pounds of potatoes. The green beans were simmering. She had deviled eggs she'd made yesterday. Four or five pound cakes, two or three pies. No lemon pie. They'd all gone into the lemonade. But anyway, she got everything taken care of and got herself to church. And after everybody had finished, everybody just kind of started pulling up and congregating and all of us filtering out and she had the table ready and we sat down. Now, there was one thing back in those days, the kids did not eat first and I didn't taste a piece of chicken breast till I was old enough to buy it and cook it myself. No, ma'am. We were in the kitchen eating where the kids ate and the grown-ups were in the dining room eating and talking. And well, when we ate and then we ate and we couldn't eat another bite. And so my aunts and mom and grandma, why they got fresh, clean tablecloths and they just swooshed them out over the table to cover up the food, you know, to keep the flies off because we'd be eating the same thing for supper. And the men folk moseyed on out the side door down towards the barn where in just a second or two, they had the hood up on that green John Deere tractor, all of them chewing tobacco and spitting and poking and prodding and talking about diesel and the price of gas and politics and why the women folk, my grandma and my aunts, my mom, they moseyed out to the front porch and they were swinging and rocking and fanning, you know, with the farmer's market bulletin and talking about good godly things being as how it was Sunday, like who wore what dress to church and how many times they'd already wore that dress and who went and raising their kids right and, you know, those things, godly things. And all of us kids. Well, we had learned that if you want to learn what's going on in the grown-up world, you have to develop early on the lingering and learning skill. And I mean, we had it down. Part of us was walking around the outside of the porch rail, just pretending like we didn't even know grown-ups were there. Part of us was chunking rocks down the front steps, just trying to think that that was exciting. Then there was some of them just laying on the porch floor, meshing ants with their finger. That kind of lingering and learning. We learned a lot of grown-up stuff that way. And about that time, while we were getting good and, and you know, educated, my uncles, 1957, navy blue, oxidized Ford Fairlane, gave a little shiver. Now, he loved that car. None of us didn't even want to ride in it. He loved it so much. But it gave a little shiver. And then a little shimmy. And then my grandma, she noticed it because of that foreboding in the back of her head. The hair is kind of stood up again. And she perked right up out of that rocking chair. That car gave a shimmy, a shiver, and then it lit out. Right down the front yard, headed straight for the fence and the front pasture. Well, those women, my grandma, my aunts, it was like a passel of guinea hens. It was like a whole pack of scalded dogs. They leaped to action, jumping down those front porch steps, jumping down the terrace steps. And that was a feat because not a one of them had taken their Sunday go to meeting shoes off and replaced them with their common sense work shoes. They lit out, caterwauling every step of the way. The men folk heard the terrible racket and they came running from the barn just about the time that blue oxidized 1957 Ford Fairlane passed them, passed them. And they veered as a unit straight in there after it. Now the kids, us, you know, we had learned when things like this out of the ordinary go on, you don't want to be too close. So we fanned out behind the women and that car was getting it. I am here to tell you, it was moving on. And that 1957 Ford Lane, Fair Lane, it hit that barbed wire fence. The top two strands just clawed up the hood. The middle strand of barbed wire caught that radiator and it was kind of shimmying. The bottom two strands were right across the two front tires. It hit that barbed wire fence and then it just stretched out there. And then it paused pause. And as kids, we were backing up. 
we're good with a slingshot. And we knew what Paul's was. That car paused, and then that barbed wire fence slung that thing right back up the hill. Those men split in two waves, and the women were back and back in those Sunday go to meeting shoes. I mean, their heels was ruined. Got back up the hill, paused another second, and lit out, free from any driver that might try to rein it in. Hit that barbed wire fence this well time. It hit it with enough pressure that the top strand went clear over the top. The second strand kind of busted the windshield wipers off, and that strand that was over the radiator last time went clear under. Once again, it stretched forward. Once again, there was a pause. Collectively, everybody let their breath out. And then we heard it from either side of that car. Pow, 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 pow. Those chestnut fence posts started popping out of that ground like you never believe. The whole front fence row came loose. And when that happened, I'm here to tell you, I witnessed my first Bob wire slinky. Now, I know you all probably are like me. You've got scars on your forehead and your knees, and barbed wire is a dangerous thing, but I never seen anything like it. It popped that fence line loose, and that barbed wire creeped around to the back and twisted in a terrible tangle. The car didn't slow down a bit. It lit off down the pasture. The men this time were galloping along on either side, about even with the passenger's door. The women were still right behind it, but they were jumping and a-leaping, dodging that barbed wire slinky. Well, us kids, we found out, and we were lingering back. And of course, now, nobody ever went in the pasture unless they were hauling hay or sweet feed. So the cows had lined up behind us too. And they were bellering and hauling. And we were trying not to get tromped on. And then the beagles and the bird dogs knew for certain there had to be somebody running some kind of varmint and they chimed in. And it was just about to the top terrace. There was one terrace in the garden. I mean, the pasture. Once you cleared that terrace, it was clear, clean, smooth running to the river. And that's where that car was bound and determined to go. Well, my grandpa, he played football during the Depression, and so he swung out far to the left in an attempt to intersect it. And when the car came by, he grabbed hold of the handle on the driver's side of the door, just dragging along pretty good. He had a pretty good hold and was trying to get that door open to get to the brake. Just when he hit a fresh, fresh pile of cow near, you know what that's like. If you're not trying to cure athlete's feet, you don't want to hit it. He hit it. His feet flew out from under him and that car went airborne over the terrace. And he's just hanging on the side like a tail on a kite. And the women were just a screaming and a crying. And all us kids, we was hanging back and lingering, you know. And that's when we spotted it. Out of that passenger's window of that car, the most beautiful Tarzan dive you have ever seen was executed straight into the blackberry patch. We knew exactly who it was. I forgot to mention it to you. I had this cousin and he was named T. And I thought that was his name until the day of his funeral, I found out different. T was a, the oldest of our whole little pack and parcel. And T was the kind that if you said, don't do it, he would say, um, why not? And if you said, don't play in the road, he'd lay on the yellow line. And so he had got that name early on. Here comes trouble batting down the hatches. Here comes trouble, put up the sharp things. And it had gotten shortened to T. And we knew the minute we saw that coonskin cap on that little head that flew out of that passenger's window, it was T. And we knew what to do. We started peeling off one at a time into our own bushes following our own little rabbit trails and deer trails. And we had practiced Davy Crockett style many, many times. And we hit it, fading around the edge of the pasture, lit out to the woods, jumping the rocks through the swampy part. We knew where he's going. 
because from lingering and learning, we knew it didn't matter what the grown-ups told you. Grown-ups, they might tell you they could when they were little, but grown-ups could not climb trees. No, ma'am. We had trees staked out all over that farm when we needed a place to go, when we had learned enough. We had trees everywhere. And old T, he had lit out for that sycamore tree. He hit that tree full speed. He was gifted. We thought it was the coonskin cap. He jumped up, grabbed that bottom limb, and he was going so fast, it just flung him over the limb. He didn't even pause. He started climbing hand over foot, foot over hand all the way up. We hit that tree, looked up, and he said, they ain't nothing here for you but trouble. Get up or get going. Well, we knew he was right. We knew he was right. And we knew that trouble could cost us fresh squeezed lemonade. So we kept going straight across the creek and on over Old Baldy the hill. Meanwhile, back in the pasture, that car cleared that. It cleared that terrace. My grandpa's just hanging on. My grandma, she gave birth to six kids of her own, raised six of her brothers when they died and raised all 18 of us. And she got a hitch in her come along. And she just bent over, stitching her side. She was trying to catch her breath. She bent over there. And when she raised up, the foreboding hit her again. Hair on the back of her head tangled. Because right there in front of her eyes, the sunset, blood red, and framed in front of her face in the edge of the woods, tallest tree on the farm. And as she stood there most perplexed, a stream of light, one last lingering ray of sunshine before the day was done, shot out of that red sunset straight into that little sycamore tree. And she could see in the top, the coonskin cap and that tree swaying back and forth like the hands of God reaching up to the heavens. Well, my grandma, you know, she kind of fluffed her hair and she fluffed out her apron and her dress of woman, her age galloping in a pasture. She pivoted on her heel and headed back to the house while well, she had supper to get laid out and lemonade to serve. And as she started up that hill, she could be heard once again talking to her imaginary friend. Lord, Lord, you got my troubles right in the palms of your hands. And that lemonade was something to remember. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for that. I got to say, I didn't get the email about the recurring theme of lemonade tonight, y'all. Um, <laughs> uh, there was one. Uh, I believe you. Uh, um, um, wait, I wanted to ask, oh, where in North Georgia are you? You know, because you know, I'm, I live I'm in Ball Ground, Georgia. I don't know what Ball Ground is. <laughs> that's I, cool. I met you at Dollywood, at Dreammore. Oh, that's why I remember you. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, that was the second to the last gig before the pandemic at dream. Yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> we were, it was a, a, a thing called, um, for those listening, eavesdropping on this conversation, it was, uh, uh, lyrics and lore. And, um, uh, it was neat to have that gig and yeah, uh, enjoyed. Yeah. Um, ball ground, not to be confused with fair play, Georgia, which is no. a, which I can get it mixed up in my mind, but there is a ball ground. There is a fair play. Well, that's uh, very cool. Thank you for that. Um, and now I have to read some more copy here. Thank you so much, Shelly. Give it up again for Shelly, by the way, if I wiggle your fingers. All right. Um, uh, I know y'all are chomping at the bit. Voting begins after the last teller. After the final recaps and after I say a bunch of stuff and voting does not begin, judges, everybody, pay attention until I say one, two, three, go. And then you may start voting. And then I'll do my set and you don't have to listen because you're voting. All right. 
Uh, our next story is Gary. Gary, you live in West Virginia, and I I collected um, how to pronounce names, and I failed to get yours. Most of us would say Buchanan, but you live in West Virginia, so I was wondering, is it Buchanan? No, it's Buchanan. It is Buchanan. Okay, I humbly apologized, which is Southern Baptist, obviously, for humbly po apologize. Um, <laughs> So now I will pronounce your name correctly, and I will read uh, your um, your bio. Barry Buchanan, Gary, Bur Gary Buchanan lives in Creston, West Virginia, and has been lying since his childhood. He has participated in liars contests in West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, Kentucky, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Gary often receives top liar when he competes, with occasional second or third place finishes. He has received a People's Choice Award. Please welcome Gary Buchanan. Hi, Gary. Hello. Good evening, and thank you to the Susquehanna Folk Festival for inviting me to this event. I grew up in a poor rural community in West Virginia, and that was okay, you see, because everyone who lived there was on what they called the same socioeconomic level. That meant we were all poor. We didn't know it because we didn't have anything to compare it to. And me and my friend Lester, we had no idea of the concept of poverty. We just knew everyone who lived around us didn't have any money. Occasionally, my mom or Lester's mom would give one of us a nickel, and we would walk the two miles to Wilson's Five and Don and share some candy. We always got the same thing, sugar babies. We'd carefully open the package, we'd divide the pieces of candy into two equal groups, and then we'd each take our share, put them in our shirt pocket, and we'd walk home, eating sugar babies and making up stories. <clears throat> One year, right before Christmas, something really exciting happened in our town. Mr. Woodyard, one of our neighbors who worked on a riverboat, got a Christmas bonus from his boss. And Mr. Woodyard used that money to buy a television set. It was the first TV in our neighborhood and everyone was excited to see it. And Mr. Woodard was a firm believer that the less you use something, the longer it would last. So he told everyone that his TV set would be on one hour a day, five days a week, from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. At 6 p.m., he'd watch the local news, and at 6.30, he'd watch the national news, and then that would be it the next day. Well, the adults in the community soon lost interest because they were used to getting their news from the local newspaper, but not us kids. Every day, about a quarter to six, a group of kids would gather in his yard and Mr. Woodyard would come out and tell us the rules. First, you have to wipe your feet before you go in the house. Second, there would be no talking or leaving during the hour. And third, if you had any business you needed to take care of, you needed to go to the outhouse now. And then a few minutes before six, he would usher us into his living room. He would sit us on the floor in front of the TV. And then Mrs. Woodyard would come in with some small Dixie cups with Kool-Aid. He would turn on the TV and we were mesmerized. Of course, we didn't understand what most of the news they were talking about was. And also when the commercials came on, they advertised products we hadn't even heard of. But we loved it. And then one evening on the national news, there was a story about two young boys in Florida, about the same age as me and Lester. And they were making money for Christmas by selling lemonade on the sidewalk in front of their house. And me and Lester knew that was for us because Lester's mom made the best lemonade in the county. So we went to Lester's mom and asked her if she would teach us how to make lemonade. And she said yes. And she wrote down the recipe for us. Then I showed the recipe to my mom, and my mom said when she went to the AMP on Friday, she would get the ingredients. And on Saturday morning, Lester's mom taught us how to make lemonade. But now we needed a stand. So my dad said he had some old wooden soap boxes in the shed that we could use. So we went out and got four of those, and we cobbled them together with some twine. And then Lester took one of his Wheaties boxes and turned it inside out and wrote lemonade, 10 cents on it, and packed it to the front. I got two buckets out of my dad's shed for us to sit on, and we were ready to go. 
So Monday, we hurried home from the bus. We made a picture of lemonade. We took the picture of lemonade and the glasses out of our stand, and we were ready for our customers. And we waited. And we waited. And it started getting dark. And no one came. So we put the lemonade back away, and we said, we're going to try it on Tuesday. So on Tuesday, the same thing happened. No one came. On Wednesday, Lester and I were getting really discouraged. No one showed up for our lemonade. On Thursday, we were, uh, Lester changed the sign, the lemonade, five cents. And we we're just about ready to give up when a strange car pulled up in front. And we knew it was a strange car because Lester and I knew every make, model, and color of car in our neighborhood. And this was one of them. And then the man got out. At first, we thought he was from the funeral home because he owned a suit and tie. And no man in our neighborhood ever wore a suit and tie except on Sunday. He walked over to our stand. He said, I'd like a lemonade, please. And he put down a nickel. Lester started to pour the lemonade into the glass out of the pitcher. And it had gotten so cold that the lemonade came out in two big chunks. The man just smiled, picked up the glass, took a sip of what little bit of liquid there was. And then he said, boys, this is the best lemonade I've ever tasted. Do you have the recipe? Lester said, yes, sir, I do. He said, I'll tell you what, son, I'll just give you $5 for that recipe. Then instantly, Lester became the road runner from the cartoons. He was there. There was a street to his house, a street back, and there was Lester again. And he had the recipe in his hand. And he gave it to the man. Then the man asked me, are you two boys partners? And I said, yes, I am. Yes, we are. He said, I tell you what, I'll just give you $5 as well. Now, he took the recipe, got back in his car, and drove off. And Lester and I did the math. And we figured that we could each have 100 candy bars of our own. So we decided to retire from the lemonade business. On Saturday, we took apart the lemonade stand, put it all back in the shed, and we walked to Wilson's Five and Dime, and we each had our own candy bar. And over the next few weeks, every Saturday, we went back to Wilson's to get a candy. And we were able to test a wide variety of kinds of candy. And I come to the conclusion that I really like the Snickers, but Lester liked the Hershey bar with almonds. Neither one of us could figure out why anyone would eat a Heath bar. <laughs> then a few weeks later, we were watching the national news in Mr. Woodger's living room. And there on the TV was the man who had bought the recipe. And the newscaster was saying, this man worked for a company called Minute Maid. And he was there on the national news to introduce their brand new product, frozen lemonade. So if you're out and about this summer at a fair or a festival and you see someone selling lemonade, you can tell them that you met one of the people who invented it. And that's the truth, more or less. Thank you for listening to my story. All right. Thank you, Gary Buchanan. Let me see fingers, fingers, people, <laughs> fingers. Show great, gracious audience participation. Um, uh, Gary, what, what, what day job do you have? I'm retired. <laughs> so you're not going to tell me what you did before. Well, I was our county's 911 director. You were what? Our county's 911 director. Oh, wow. That's like responsible for all emergency services in the county. Right. That's important. I mean, that's not just, I mean, that's, you saved lives and stuff. Um, I didn't save any lives. <laughs> yeah. Indirectly, you did. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for your service. And um, thanks for uh, letting me ask you what your day job was when you had one of those. Um, and, uh, and now, all right. It's time for me to recap. So we're getting there, y'all. We're getting close to the voting time. I am going to remind you of what the people that you heard told about. Who is your favorite liar? Oh, look, there's a there's a card. I love these cards that are that are jumping up. All right. Um, Ken Carnes, 
um, he told a story of a bulldog, uh, a bullfrog. It was a bulldog-sized bullfrog and a snake eating each other. That's what Ken told us about. Uh, Jason Sable um, told about a, a buckskin mitten being turned into a catcher's mitt um, with his friend Bucky and Delmont and um, how they played ball together and how they pitched and how uh, Bucky went to um, the bullpen of the majors in Pittsburgh. David Mayer Smith, um, he told the story of going to a one-tap bar and talking uh, with Rudy Moss, who was a miner who survived um, a mine disaster, but they were being taken. Um, Lorena, I'm going to say this, Bergvist, she told the story of um, how she pacified a wolf with music from Spotify and Mozart, and then the wolf turned out to be Prince, the performer known as Prince. Sandy Schumann told about inventing the sideways yo-yo by making it from a saw blade frisbee, single disc, double string yo-yo. That's what Sandy told about. Ken Parsons told of, in rhyme, told Patty McBride and how his odor uh, saved the town from a tsunami and sacrificed himself for that. Leslie Shelley uh, told about her grandmama and her superstitions and how a 1957 Ford Fairlane took off and uh, apparently unaided by somebody, but it turned out to be her cousin T. And Gary, whom you just heard, um, told about the first TV in the neighborhood and then selling lemonade to a fellow who went on to invent Minute Maid Lemonade. And Gary should be a millionaire for inventing that with his friend um, Lester, but that did not come to pass. And that is, those are the people. Wait, I haven't said it yet. I haven't said it. All right, let me, uh, um, describing the uh, how the system works one more time. You, that be you, the participants who are watching this, uh, the audience, you are voting for the liar or the lie you like best. Um, the audience vote along with the judges' scores determines the winner. We're using the honor system, one vote, vote per viewer. Look for the link in the chat or go to sesquahannafolk.org slash vote. And voting will um, go for seven minutes. You have seven minutes to vote. I think that completes everything I need to say. Jess, am I on track here right now? Am I doing okay? Yes, Jess says yes. Jess is my DG designated grown-up and now i am going to um tell you a little story i'm turning on my little clock so i can see what my time is and then uh when the judges give me the envelope um we will reveal the winners and uh i will tell you more about that when we come to it um, i'm not gonna play my guitar yet this is a, a an old story of my aunt marguerite my aunt marguerite if you've never seen me work before you need to know that she is 85 years old and just graduated from medical school. The way she explains it is like this. My girlfriend, Mary Frances and I, our husbands have passed on and we were tired of the bridge club and the garden club. So we all went back to medical school. We, we, we did that. Uh, Mary Frances, went, I went to Emory. They all may have heard of Emory. I don't know if y'all have heard of Emory. Uh, that's where, um, the, a lot of heart procedures were invented at Emory University. That's where that Irish girl invented that uh, procedure named after her. Her name is angioplasty. It's not going to get any better. Anyway, Mary Frances and I have a hospital. We hope you come and see us. We serve two purposes in our community. We're hospice for people who aren't ready to admit it. Over the emergency room, for the shame, we have a little antebellum home. It was a, uh, it was falling in. We bought it cheap, and when, when Gene Cannon retired from his pure oil station, we uh, put an air hose bell in the portico, carport portico, and that's our emergency lane. And we were in there one day, and y'all know Ray McFolin, don't you? Ray Ray has the asthma. And he has an albuterol inhaler in his pocket. And he was driving one day and he took that albuterol inhaler and 
but it had a sucret in the barrel. You know, a, a lozenge. Y'all remember sucret? It was in the barrel, and it got in his esophagus. Oh, he was in a bad way, and it wasn't going to dissolve because it was still in the wrapper. So he came to our hospital, and he go. He went over the air hose bell in the in the carport portico. Kang kang! Oh, we have an emergency. Let's go see who it is. And we walked out there, and we rushed him inside. He was in a bad way, and, and we took him inside. Well. We have a little, you know, kitchen in our hospital where we'll make our lunch. And Mary Frances pulled out her favorite hot sauce. It's called Scorned Woman. And she put it in a little pill cup. You know, those little cups like you get catch up in at McDonald's. You know, she poured a little bit in there. Except this is a medical supply, so it's $40. And she said, drink this down. And he was healed. Well, that introduces you to Mary Frances and my Aunt Marguerite. Uh, when my son was a little boy, he was very skinny. We are skinny men in my family. He, he and I weigh the exact same thing. I'm 6'4", he's 6'6". Six, six. We both weigh 155 pounds. <laughs> so Liam is this tall, skinny kid. Well, when he was a little kid, he was also skinny because I don't feed him. And um, there's a park right here. This is my front porch, by the way, y'all. There's a park up yonder. And uh, there's the big old school swings. There's a big old school merry-go-round. It's not all colorful and plasticky and pretty. And the bolts aren't covered with foam. And there's no chips. Uh, no, you, you, you just risk your life at our old playground. There's a slide. Finally, somebody put a slide. Caution, slide hot in summer. For people who don't know the properties of, you know, the sun on metal. And... Liam wanted to show Aunt Marguerite that he could swing in the swing by himself without being pushed. Now, this was not about coordination. This was about this was about um, his ability to pump himself because he was so light and skinny. And he was five years old. And Marguerite would come over any time in the summer. She said, what's Liam doing? I'm going to kidnap him, and he and I are going to go and do something. So that's what we did. He, he said... Hey, Marguerite, let's go to the park. I want to show you I can swing. And all right, sugar. And they walked hand in hand. the sweetest little thing, this old lady and this little bitty kid walking down to my park. And, and Marguerite looked at the swings. And she's an active person. She's an action old lady. But she saw those swings. And she had a fear that Liam was going want, to gonna want her to swing with her. Because when I was a girl, the swing seat was flat. Uh, it was made of a material called wood, and it hung from the chain. Those swings have been there since the 1940s now. But now they have a rubber strap. Have y'all seen these swings that they have nowadays? It's a rubber strap. It's about half an inch thick. It's about eight inches wide. And, and I have arthritis in my hip, and sometimes my hip doesn't doesn't does it doesn't like a curve like that that's why i still drive my 1968 plymouth fury 2 because it has a bench seat and i put beads on it to make it harder and flat well liam was swinging and he was showing me how he could pump that swing and he said swing with me swing with me please 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 and he turned up the volume on that please well i sat down uh, that that strap, you know, they designed that. You know where they first saw those those straps? They found those in a, the basement of a 16th century Spanish church. That's where they came from. And I sat in that, that swing and it went, and my hip came out from from the socket there. And they say later that I, they thought there was a Tibetan monk out in the park because I went, whoa. Well, Shirley was there. Shirley's the secretary over at the church, and she was there with her little iPhone, and she called, she called the nine one one, and I couldn't get my feet on the ground, and and so the wee 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 in our town, if one emergency vehicle comes, they all show up, and they couldn't, I, they couldn't, they had to cut me out with the jaws of life, and put me in the ambulance. And took me. I told them take take me to my own hospital. So they took me to the hospital. Clang clang. Mary Frances came out and said, "What is wrong with you?" So that night, 
Marguerite went back home. She likes to sleep with the windows open, even in the summertime. And sometimes her husband comes to her. She's been a widow a long time. Ask me how long she's been a widow. Well, when Charles passed away, we got his and hers tombstones. That's a better value. And there's his name on it. And the year he was born, and the year he died. And there's my name on it. And the year I was born. And then there's a 19. My tombstone's got the Y2K. I told my nephew, Andy, he thinks he's funny. He said, oh, calm down, ain't Marguerite. It's not like it's etched in. And I, I was in bed that night. I was in pain, and I had written myself a prescription for Loretel. And Marguerite was reading a book. She was reading God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater by Kurt Vonnegut. And as she was reading, the book fell on her chest. She was listening to the crickets outside her window. And right then, right before she hit that sleep, before that dream, that magical place, she heard Uncle Charles come to her. And he said, Darling, that swing in the park's a butt squeezer. It's like trying to sit on a tweezer. Next time say no, it'll hurt your popo, and that's because you're an old geezer. Marguerite said out loud, You old dead fool. A geezer is a man. A bitty is a woman. And that was uncalled for. So that's the story of Marguerite, the only time she's ever been on a rubber-strapped swing. Thank you very much. I'm guessing that was a little better than seven minutes. Uh, Jess, how are we doing? Are the, are the judges ready? I'm not sure. Could anyone else jump up and let us know, Lori or someone else? <laughs> Nobody's responding. I can't do a song or something, but I don't want to take up too much time because we're reaching our two-hour mark. Um, let me see if there's anything I'm supposed to say. All right. Uh, I'm supposed to briefly thank the tellers. Thank you, tellers. I'm not going to look up all your names right now because I'll goof that up, but we're so grateful. Hey, for reals, y'all. Um, whether you win or not, it's still a volunteer thing, and um, you have to write the stuff and come up with the material and be doing it on the Zoom. And uh, I pretty much know that most of you have performed live and this is harder. So I'm really, really, really grateful that, and we are all grateful that you, um, you did that. All right. During this time, the judges will deliberate. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. When I finish, say something like, this is what it says here. Say something like the judges have handed me the envelope. Have the judges handed me the envelope? Do we have a tabulation? Somewhere there should be a tabulation of some sort, right? <laughs> And, oh, wait, I'm supposed to get a text when it comes in, right? Isn't that what Tom told me? I'm gonna make, let me check my texts. Nope. Uh, so. How about right you now, sing, a, sing a song and I'll I will, check into I will it while song, you're doing that. <laughs> and, um, I will um, sing a song. It's not wasting time. It's using time. And I will sing a song. And I know a lot of you like traditional stories instead of, um, and this is still a tall tale of its kind. And I'm putting my, my phone clock up here so you can't see it. Oh, by the way, y'all like my glasses? These are my mullet glasses because they're business in the front and party in the back. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a trained humorist. Um, all right. This is a traditional story. Um, it's actually a, a Greek um, epic poem. This is Homer's Odyssey. Uh, we'll be here till uh, Saturday. I am just a rambling boy, Ithaca bound. That's obviously in New York. Making my way there from Troy. Here's an adventure that I found. Is the Cyclops winking or blinking? That eyeball in his head. I listen for sounds of serenity with every word that he has said. 
And I notice his squint, his mouth smirky slant. Can I see a friendly glint? No, I can't. And his complimentary ments are covered with ants. Is Cyclops winking or blinking? Oh, is a Cyclops winking or blinking? How can I judge his mood? I wonder what he is thinking. I'm thinking he thinks of me as food. Compared to this giant, I'm a little shrimp. He's putting mascara on his one eye to primp. How can you tell if a snake has a limp? And is Cyclops winking or blinking? Is a cyclops blinking or blinking? I just want to leave this cave. And from the way this cavern is stinking, I can tell polyphemus don't never bathe. I'm wondering how this drama ends. This giant ain't getting no help from his friends, but he only pays half for his contact lens. And is cyclops winking or blinking? This is the end of the instrumental verse. It's not really an instrument, but it could be for Kurt worse. And if I don't whistle, Miss Sheila will curse. And she doesn't like to curse because she's a good woman, really, and she's just not appropriate for her. Is the Cyclops winking or blinking? Oh, is the Cyclops winking or blinking? All alone, he feels bereft. And I saw him try to swat that fly. It's clear he cannot perceive depth. So I stabbed him in the eye. Yes, I know you. Sometimes you got to try when there's nothing else to do. Now I've got to ride out underneath this you. Uh, all right. Obviously, you know, Homer's Odyssey. This is Odysseus. And Odysseus is traveling. He's making his way back to Troy, Alabama. And he, he, he loses some of his fellow travelers. And they come to a cave. He comes to a cave and smells something cooking in the cave. You know, it smells delicious, some sort of meat. And he goes into the cave. And what he finds out is what's cooking in the cave are his fellow travelers, and they're being cooked by Polyphemus. Polyphemus is the name of the Cyclops. Polyphemus obviously means many Femuses. Or I think the plural would be Femi. Anyway, so um, uh, Polyphemus wants to eat, you know, Odysseus. But, you know, he's concerned about his food and his food sources, and he likes to know his food sources. So Polyphemus asks Odysseus, what is your name? And Odysseus is wise to his plan. So he picks up a stick. He starts whittling. He's got his pocket knife. He goes, nobody. What is your name? Nobody. What is your name? Nobody. What is your... And he stabs him in the eye with a stick. And so Polyphemus starts yelling, Nobody has stabbed me in the eye! Nobody has stabbed me in the eye! By the way, my neighbors have to hear this every once in a while. They do not know what I do for a living or what is going on. Nobody has stabbed me in the eye! And the other giants in the neighborhood, they hear Polyphemus and they say, Nobody has stabbed Polyphemus in the eye. Nobody has stabbed Polyphemus in the eye. So I guess Polyphemus ain't stabbed in the eye. <laughs> and so Odysseus is hiding under that sheep, you know, and he's going to make his way out of the cave. And and uh, Polyphemus is so dumb that, you know, he ends his sentences with prepositions. going, where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? But he's under a, you, a sheep, a female sheep. See, if I could hear you, I would have you sing along, but so, I mean, it doesn't really... He's no longer winking or blinking, oh, he's no longer winking or blinking. That completes that story song. I'm going to hang this up on my guitar stand, and I'm waiting for... Is there, is there, is there something in the chat for me? I believe or, that you should have received a text. Why don't you give that a try? A I understand. Uh, and I could. Don't have a text. A, a oh, recent. no. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I hear crickets. That's what oh. I'm feeling right now. I'm feeling crickets. <laughs> and they're actually, there are real ones out here. And the uh, cicadas will start. And uh, I mean, the. the Katie Diz will start in a few minutes because uh, it's getting dark. All right. So I see lots of stuff in the chat. So I'm just going to, y'all just bear with us because um, I'm waiting for the envelope. And is there one to me? If there is one to me, somebody tell me that there's a chat to me specifically. 
Um, somebody said, go Andy, sing a song. All right, so I can't read chats when I'm doing this, y'all, because I'm too far away with my glasses and I'm concentrating on uh, stuff I'm supposed to be doing. But I do not have a text. And um, uh, Jess, you have my number, correct? Yes, how about I, since I do know the winners, I will text them to you. <laughs> Would, <laughs> wouldn't that be smart? <laughs> okay. We are uh, it, coming your way. way. <laughs> no, that's groovy. That's fine. It's, All right. Uh, but another song, if you if you know another one, boy, we'd love to Of course I know another what? song. God, you, <laughs> you want another song, really? Are you kidding? No, no, I'm not joking. Okay, fine. <laughs> Fine, fine. I'm using passive aggressive voice. Fine. I'll do another song. Fine. I hope you happy. Um, let me turn off this text window because I don't like it. And I don't know how to uh, make that go away. Bonk. Okay, stop. Oh, close. Wait. No, wait. Is that going to close? Close the chat. All right, good. <sighs> I get really stressed about that. I I'm here to tell you, people, performing on stage in front of a lot of people is easier than performing on my porch where my neighbor's going, there goes Andy again yelling at people that aren't there. I don't know what he's doing up there on his porch up on that hill. I've never heard such a thing. Um, uh, uh, this is a, a song I wrote in my college biology class at Georgia College. Go you hairy colonials. We were the colonials. Now they're the bobcats. That's so lame. It just our 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 colors were brown and yellow. They called the yellow gold, but it was really brown and yellow. Anyway, I was in Dr. Barman's class, and Dr. Barman's that kind of guy that um, you know, is the and I love to tell young people this. Um, this it's the big stadium kind of classroom. There's about a hundred of us in there, and we're taking biology for people who want to graduate from college. It's not for science majors or anything like that. And um, he used something called a chalkboard. Um, I just got a text. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and sing this now. He he used something called a chalkboard, and uh, this is my one man play. I'm going to do for you now um, before I sing the song. Actually, the name of this one man play is. Things never said in front of a chalkboard as opposed to a PowerPoint presentation. That's the name of the play. And so begins the play. I'm sorry, I can't get this to work. Please bear with me. That completes the play. Things never said in front of a chalkboard as opposed to a PowerPoint presentation. Anyway, um, I had made a D on the test. And he passed the test back. And there was this girl next to me that I was kind of attracted to. And she saw the bloody mess because he... He graded our test with a broad tipped red magic marker because he had no care about our self-esteem. And I saw, saw her look at the, the bloody mess and she said, ew. And then what I did was he went to the board and he started telling us all the answers on the test. Like now I need them. And I took all the answers on the test and I wrote this song overnight in my dorm room. And I went to his office the next morning. Dr. Barman. Yes, Mr. Irwin. I'd like to sing you a song. I was wondering why you had that guitar on your neck. And so I sang him this song, and I will brag and tell you that this song now, this is true, Scott's honor, this song appears on the National Society, International Society of Protozoologists website, right next to Christine Lavin's Amoeba Hop. And so there's a little foreshadowing. This song is about the Clamidomonas, you shape like a pear. Clamidomonas, you ain't got no hair. Just two flagella sticking out your end. I put you under my microscope and watch you swim. Clavinomonas, you've got your fill of chloroplast making that chlorophyll. Clavinomonas, you are the most. You're down the manufacturing that sweet glucose. The bridge. The Clamidomonas is a unicellular organism that manufactures chlorophyll from its chloroplast. Yeah, hey! The Clamidomonas can reproduce both sexually or asexually. In other words, if they wish to have a relationship, that's fine. But if they don't feel it's going to be compatible, they just split. Visual aid. Your ptosis or my ptosis? <clears throat> Last verse. Clamidomonas. 
Clamidomonas, my unicellular friend. To every organism, there must be an end. What's that approaching? The shape of this red blood. And you're about to be consumed by M. Amoeba. Ba ba ba. Wiggle fingers, thank you so much. All right. I see texts coming in on my phone, my Swiss Army phone, which is also my clock. See, I use it for a clock. I use it to call people. And I need to tell you, before I read the the, the things, that there are going to be three places. Why, oh, why, the judges have given me the envelope. And you can tell that the judges were drinking coffee and spilled it um, on the envelope when they were deliberating because it was so serious. They were just down in the coffee trying to make the right decision. All right, there are going to be three um, uh, announced people. There's going to be a third place, a second place, and a first place. Third place winner will win $50. The second place winner will win $75. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. Third place winner. I mean, first, I mean, and the winner winner, the winner 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 will win $100. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. And if you're living in Canada, that's going to be kind of, you know, going to be more okay or something like that all right so now i'm going to uh announce the winners and tell you um i don't have last names on this so i'm going to just say first names and um because i can't remember <laughs> Um, oh, okay. There I got it. There I got it. There I got it. And here are the windows winners. Do we have, do we have a drum roll? Is that still That's lame. Stop it. All right. <laughs> Third place is David Mayer Smith. Wiggle your fingers for David. Yay, David. Congratulations. Second place is Jason Sobel. Give it up for Jason. Yay. Congratulations, Jason. And, uh, first place is Ken Parsons, give it up for Ken. All of you, all of you, all of you. Oh, congratulations, man. And and thank you all. And all of the stories, man. It's always it's always oranges and apples with these things. It's so the, the stories were all so rich and so interesting. And uh I am honored to uh have participated and shared this virtual stage with all of you. And um thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for joining me on my porch. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Jess, the DG designated grown up. Take it away, Jess. Look at the camera till you're clear. And tell Jess, unmute herself. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to look like this until Jess starts talking. Yes, Jess, you are mute. Jess, you're muted. Okay. okay, I I worked it out. So I'm going to add myself to this great group of tellers. So thank you so much for letting me be on the stage with you. So I'd like to thank all the committee that put this together, especially Tom and Sue, who are our chairs. So thank you so much to them. Um, like to, to thank uh, Mina Edmondson for also being on the committee and myself, Lori Brandenburg and uh, Andy stopped in for lots of our uh, meetings. So that was really, really great to have him. Thank you to all our liars that participated from near and far. It's great to see you all. Special thanks for the some of you that added the lemonade uh, theme into your stories. Oh, that was a theme. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we we said that you'd get a little special kudos for that because we feel like this last year we just had to make lemon lemonade out of all the lemons that were handed to us. So I loved I'd love to hear the creativity of the folks that did that. Um, thank you to the audience for attending. And uh, I have a couple of little uh, uh, slides for you to take a look at and then uh, if you want to stay on and chat with people, that would be great. So thank you again. This has been a wonderful, wonderful evening. So let's see what we have here. We're going to have one by Ernest Arnold and Lucky Jake.
Folks, they all say you got up here to tell the truth. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to tell you a pure deal old lie. One time down in Oklahoma, when I was farming, I raised some pumpkins, and they were so big, one of them was, I hauled it out and made a house. I hired me three carpenters to put petitions in it, and uh, I made uh, 42 three-room uh, three apartments. Well, that ain't nice, folks. No way down east of Oklahoma, I'll make a big old steel pot, 25 miles around it, 5 miles deep. What are you going to do with a big pot like that? I'm going to cook that tongue you raised in it. <laughs> Here we are back again. What a great night. Thank you to the judges. We have uh, two out of the three I see are on. So how was it for the judges? Tough, tough job? It, it was a good tough. That was it. <laughs> and, uh, so it's always good to hear stories and, and, uh, and just have the opportunity to be delighted by the different ways things were told. Thank you. I think good tough is a good way to put it. And, um, you know, the, the three judges were pretty close in our scoring. We agreed almost on almost everything. So did the did the popular vote? Was it similar to the judges or was it totally different, JJ? Um, it was very similar. Oh, very interesting. OK, that's not always the case. Wonderful. <laughs> yeah. How was the experience for the tellers? Was it uh, did you feel the audience was with you or did it work well on Zoom as well as it could be on Zoom? It was, it was nice. It was good. I just, you know, I've never done a Zoom thing. It, something didn't go goofy. And uh, <laughs> no, I just it always has. And it, it is so much harder um, to do this on Zoom. And I've been doing it for 18 months. I mean, I, I've been out on this porch a lot and my son it's just so kudos 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 um and even even that the text didn't come in right away it didn't matter it was everything went really really well i'm i'm really impressed with um the way the committee throwed it all together it was great <laughs> yeah like i said you you were such a big help i mean you became part of it which was it in your contract originally, well, but uh, we're you were willing to together. put the time in. So I really appreciate that. That made a difference. And, you know, every year we hope to, uh, you know, get better and better at doing these these liars contests. And last year was our first year. This year, it, it, to me, it was just a blessing to be able to bring in tellers from all over the place. I mean, yeah. that that was really, really interesting. So it was, you know, there's there's some good parts of it. Indeed. Yeah. From, from, from Georgia to Newfoundland land. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. But I got to no, practice just, that myself. <laughs> no, no, no. But it was, you know, from all over, it was, uh, that was, that was very cool. So yeah. yeah I, and I didn't get a chance to read a lot of the chats cause I was too busy trying to, to spotlight people Ooh. the best I could. And, um, but I loved how supportive all the tellers were of each other. So it just seems like it's a really nice community that I'd like to learn more about. And uh, I also love, you know, JJ, you and I have talked about this a little bit. It's just really great to kind of marry together that that old storytelling tradition with the story slam. I know there's some differences, you know, with with the format and 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 the focus, but but when it comes down to it, it's just a really, really good story. So um, you know, I think that um I think that's nice. I, I'm really, I'm, I'm pleased that there is a revived interest in storytelling, it seems like now. One of the things that's always impressed me about the storytelling community has been how supportive it is of performers. I, uh, for years and years ago, I worked, I did some work in stand-up comedy and that's kind of a, an adversarial relationship and, and storytellers are always supportive. The first, first story I told in Philly Many, many years ago, I got up and as a joke, I said, I just forgot everything I was going to say. <laughs> and the audience went, that's okay. We're with you. Just take a minute. And I was like, 
who are these people? This is Philadelphia. <laughs> That's yeah. true, though. It really is. It's really true. It's a, it's a support. Everybody wants everybody to do well. And uh, it, it, we, we all feel that, you know, when we're all doing well, our, our, our art form is stronger. So, yeah, it's not adversary. It ain't like stand up. I've done stand up, too. It ain't like it. It's, 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 it's really sweet. Yeah, so Sheila, I was really happy to welcome you into our little community. Are we, our other two judges were local. And uh, when we were seeking a judge, Andy said, well, you have to have Sheila, <laughs> you know, <laughs> my, my best buddy, you know. So it was really great getting to know your work a lot. We haven't had a chance to talk, but to get to know your work a little bit, I've watched a lot of your YouTubes and you do some really interesting things. So love to have you come and do some some telling for us sometime down the road for sure that um, sounds wonderful but you know i was appreciative for you to give your time and efforts and expertise that was really great how, how now you're in pennsylvania correct <laughs> we're in pennsylvania okay so how far are you from Bryn Mawr? Are you, i don't know where where you all are located Bryn, so. Bryn Mawr is not that far we uh i would say an hour and 45 minutes or so that's all right outside of philadelphia all right we're gonna have to talk i'll be in Bryn Mawr in october so all uh, right all right well you probably have my email address what okay. what are you doing there somebody at the college or uh, at uh at a school one of the a christian school that's in that area i've been there a couple times several times so they jumped in my schedule Excellent. really quick so i'll Wonderful. be back there and so I'll make sure to, you know, contact you and see if we can have some fun while I'm in the area. That would be great. That would be great. Love to love to make that happen. Yeah, we uh, we don't present enough storytellers. So I'd love to be able to do a little bit more of it and hear how to do it well. You know, we're all learning together. So uh, Amen. and uh, every time I mean, every time I talk to Andy, he gives me suggestions about this and that. And he was so helpful. And in uh, you know what Facebook what Facebook groups to make sure I got information on and so we had quite we had a nice number tonight and people stayed on the whole time generally which was you know great uh, you know I know we 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 beat to death the idea of you have to wait to the end to vote but I think that helps everybody stay on even if their best friend you know tells the first story and then uh, <laughs> you know they feel like they want to leave but. You know, so I think it, it made for a very cohesive evening. So I, oh, I wanted okay. to uh, thank Sheila for patching things over. We kind of had a rough start to things, and then and then JJ and Mina, they're just so fluid and just sharp and just right on their toes, and just went from one thing to another and uh, made it uh, as best that it could be uh, in the shortest period of time is, is what we had. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I, I wasn't aware of all the, the stuff happening in the background, so <laughs> uh, I was happy for Tom to be taking care of it, and uh, and the judges certainly. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of moving parts into doing this kind of thing online. Um, but you know, Andy, you helped make it seem really relaxed, even though we didn't we didn't have the judge, we didn't have the people at the end and whatnot. So to be able to just it's, kind of fill in yeah. is great. Just it just happens every time, <laughs> and. Um, what I was telling you folks, if you were late, my my internet provider sent a text today because I did a children's show and I was going to do it right here and I was set up and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, and I was you know, running early as go out and get some lunch and my internet provider said, no, there's no internet until 2.30. So I had to go, where can I go? So I went to my local music store barged in the nicest people in the world <laughs> i want to say it again mckibben music matt mckibben and, and his wife deborah and they're too nice they didn't want me in there but they were too nice to say no and um i'm kidding they they were sweet and um but you know we we pro we can't and, and in live events things go wrong mm -hmm. and uh where it's it's a little easier when you're in front of people to explain what's happening because but everybody's been really sweet. So it's, I'm really grateful, grateful to be doing this. Yeah. And that's such a great space. It looks like it, it just makes me feel like I'm outdoors. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful evening. I mean, and uh, it it's uh, just really charming. So, yeah. And it was, it was great to hear. It's always great to hear people coming from their homes and, and um, I don't know, there's something so personal so distant but personal with with the internet it's just it's a very funny it's kind true, of thing though, yeah it, it's and, and i tell people all the time and this is a, another line from another group but it you know storytelling is high touch 
entertainment. It's it's even even uh, even within live theater, and I've done a lot of live theater. You know, we're we're really expecting the audience to see what's happening, and that we're sharing the intimacy of our homes and where we really live in this electronic realm. It, it's a it, that's kind of a gift. I mean, mm -hmm. aren't you glad the pandemic so. didn't happen before this? Because yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's okay. It's, we would have been so separated. And I think right. some, some people even saw each other more, even on zoom made more of a point to get together more frequently. Yeah. So yeah, it has been, it's making lemonade, you know, <laughs> as, right. our, as our sort the theme. of theme was. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I was like, as soon as I said that, I went, wait a minute, I remember seeing that early on. Oh, focus, Andy. Anyway. Yeah. So. Four out of eight tellers use it in there. I thought great. that was yeah, very that was clever. Really I was kind of, snuck in there <laughs> yeah. it's kind of fun if i could i'd like to put in a plug for jj's york story slam she does a tremendous job of putting on an online story slam and uh she's also associated with the lancaster story slam carla wilson puts on a a great show and there's always great storytellers there and i'm not just saying that because i'm usually one of them i'm i'm saying that <laughs> because because it's it's a, a great it's great entertainment for you know and they really made the transition to the virtual really well. And it's, it was such a hard thing to do. So whenever you get a chance, I'd check it out. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, we've been really pleased because it took away any kind of geographic um, mm -hmm. barriers. And also, um, you know, people that couldn't come out on a Tuesday night to the bar for whatever reason can now attend. Um, and we would sell out every single month ahead of time. So people would show up not knowing that and try to get in. And we were always turning people away at the door. So this has made it much more accessible to many more people. And even as we start to return to in-person events next year, I think we'll keep some virtual component. This has been really great. That's cool. Mm -hmm. good, good. Yeah, it's Susquehanna Folk will be doing an emerging artist showcase uh, on the 26th of September, you know, a similar format to tonight, except uh, it'll be artists, musicians uh, playing a song. We'll have judges. Um, I know JJ was one of our judges last year. Uh, so we look forward to, uh, ag again, uh, reaching out into the community and finding who's who's uh, interested in putting their hat in the ring for, for a prize. And so we're excited about that. David, so, I have, oh, I'm sorry. I just had a, a question for David and uh, it's maybe personal. Is that, the, <laughs> is that the stay, stay puff marshmallow man behind you? It is indeed. Okay. I just thought so. Okay. And, and it, it, uh, I stole it from my brother who is here watching. <laughs> it's, it's his. I think I stole it from him when he was you know, 12 or something. But, oh yeah. Uh, yeah it's the stay, <laughs> that's the stay puff. <laughs> All right, I was just curious. Um, I'm always interested in the toys people have. Since I have my mic open, I, I, let me put in a plug for uh, First Person Arts in Philadelphia. Uh -huh. um, uh, yeah, um, I know Sheila's told stories there. That's my first. That's where I first saw your work, and it was uh -huh. wonderful. Uh, Jamie Brunson does a, a tremendous uh -huh. job down there, bringing in. At, right now, they're they're moving to curated storytellers, so they are storytellers from all over the world uh um who can handle the time zone difference and um really bringing in some some great great people and when they're their mics when they do the open mic the regular story slam you get some people walking off the street who are telling incredibly powerful stories so um i wanted to put in a plug for them as well uh, they, you can catch them online uh, as well first person arts yes I really? figure since we're making converts in this audience tonight, we, <laughs> yeah. we yeah, should yeah, spread yeah. the wealth you around. Put in a link for them. <laughs> uh, Firstpersonarts.org. Uh, yeah, I'll put it in the. Uh, put it in the uh, chat. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank you all, if I may. This has been fascinating. My last name's Heffelfinger. This might be the first group I've been amongst that knows somebody with that last name. <laughs> or let's just say there's a lot more of us around the your area than there is in Wichita, Kansas. But yeah, your stand-up 
commentary. I, I wrote a quick one. Stand up was my first love, but with a moral to the story, telling's a cut above. A showcase for what I write, and I'm getting home a whole lot earlier at night. <laughs> Storytellers versus comedians. The tellers have more class. Both might enjoy a cold one, but the tellers will use a glass. Very sweet. Mm. Thanks for having me. You guys were great. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Great to see you, David. David. And you, <laughs> and you, Sheila, always is. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.